Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it and comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website in enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. It's my pleasure to welcome James Anderson to the show. He is very interested in Austrian economics. He was involved with Ron Paul's presidential campaign, and he is with goldsilver.com, and he was referred by Michael Maloney. I'm sure that's a name you're familiar with. And we're going to talk a little bit about currencies, inflation, precious metals, and just the general outlook on some of this. I'm sure you'll enjoy this show as we talk to James Anderson. Welcome, James. How are you? Uh, Thanks, Jason. Very good. I'm glad to be here. Good, good. Well, what is your outlook on the present state of our irresponsible government and irresponsible Federal Reserve and and the powers that be? That's a great question. Day to day, we get hammered with so many things as far as, you know, what what is the new thing to worry about? You know, fundamentally, big picture, looking at it, just given the amount of promises that we've made, uh, you know, as far as a a society – uh, and how how we're going to pay that off? It it all pretty much spells the dollar losing 50, 60, 70 percent of its value, because basically they're going to pay off what they promised. They're not going to default, right? You know that that we don't believe, but the, you know they will pay back in dollars. But you know the only question is what are those dollars going to buy us, right? So you know you, you might you will get your social security check, you know, but there's no promise about what it'll buy you. The pensions will pay you, but there's no promise of what it'll get you. You know, so this is fundamentally where we're headed. It's just a question of exactly how we're going to get there and what day and what time, you know. But inevitably, that's where we're going. So that's how we feel about it. It's more of a long-term view. I I couldn't agree more, James. For an irresponsible government that buys votes from people by promising them goodies, inflation is the surest way to fool and rob the public because most people, they just simply don't get it. And it happens so slowly, it's like putting a frog in the warm water and turning up the heat slowly until he boils to death. And and that's what will happen. Defaulting is too abrupt. It's too politically unpopular. But hey, that Social Security check, it may say $800 or whatever the number is at the time and the real value of it will become progressively worth less. So that's that's where we're going because it's the easiest road out for, for an irresponsible government. Uh, it's their way of quote-unquote balancing the books, I guess. <laughs> they can keep making their stupid promises and fooling people, but eventually it really catches up and it, it hurts. You know, I think we're in a situation where we're going to see tens of millions, if not 200, 250 million or more Americans really suffer a huge decline in lifestyle through inflation. Inflation. The debasement of the dollar is a very, very real thing. But here's what I want to ask you, James. It sometimes I, I, I see how irresponsible our government is being, and certainly we'll both agree with that. And most of our listeners will too. But is the U.S. just sort of the best house in a really bad neighborhood? Because look at what the other countries are doing. I mean, most countries around the world are a mess too. Europe is in huge crisis. Every currency on earth now is a fiat currency as far as I know. Isn't it just a big race to the bottom? Isn't it just relative? Yeah, yeah, it, uh, that's true. I mean, the fact that all the Western countries, and, and they're all in trouble. They all have big debt. And, they keep, and the thing about it is, is we print our dollars. You know, every other country around the world has got to keep printing their currencies uh, so things don't get destabilized for trade. So we have an article that we put out like every quarter. It, it's, it's kind of like a joke title. It's kind of catchy. It's called Race to the Base. But it's, it's more, it's kind of sick, you know, the, the idea that, you know, the world is running around racing to debase their currencies. It, it's very sad because, like you said, most people, that it's an insidious thing, taxes, or inflation. It's a tax that... Most people, they don't didn't dawn on until it's too late, right? And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's true. It doesn't matter what fiat currency you go to. They're all going toward the bottom. Either printing, it doesn't matter, yen, euro, franc, 
you know, I don't care what you say. If it's not gold or silver, it's going to be losing value in the coming, you know, five, ten years. Well, the one thing that gives me some minor hope for optimism in a in a somewhat perverse way about America and about the dollar is that in light of everything that's going on, which is just, I mean, it's it you couldn't write fiction like this. It's so irresponsible. It's so disgusting on every level that it's just mind-boggling, really. But the U.S. has a brand, number one, and people around the world still look to that brand as a, a light of freedom to a large extent. I think it's less so than before, but still better than a lot of places. And the other thing it has is it has far and away the world's most powerful military. I'm sure you're familiar with him, but I, I interviewed John Perkins on the show, and he's the author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman and A Game as Old as Empire and a few other books. And won't we just push other countries around to keep our supremacy as the world's reserve currency? When when things get really tough, won't we just kind of force them to go our way? I don't know how long we can keep doing right. that, and it sure is ugly, well, that, but... That depends on who you believe is really running the show here. If you think that they have a loyalty to our United States, then perhaps that's true. I used to think that way, and I don't think that way anymore. The United States is more or less a carcass that's being used at this point, and it'll get tossed to the side when it's eventually done and used up and just go third world status. That's basically how I know it's, it's sad to say that, but it's happening slowly, you know, so people, it doesn't dawn on them, but it is, it is occurring. You know, unless there's a movement back toward rule of law, and then I don't, you know, expect to see a reversal of this until we go into a, in, in, into a third world look. And that's just the way it is. I, I do agree, though, you're right, that, the, you know, the military... That's what backs the dollar, really, is the fact that we have the military might, you know, and that people are still using it to trade with oil. But eventually, you know, if, if the interests of the, of the central bankers of the world uh, have their way, it probably won't be a reserve currency in the long run. And, and so just to expand on your point there, because I want to make sure the listeners understand what you were saying, and I do agree with you, by the way. I've certainly read and heard about the 12 families that run the world and studied the secret societies, and, and, and there's the central banks and the Rothschilds, et cetera, et cetera. So when you say the U.S., it depends who you believe is running things, and the U.S. is just a carcass that's being used to a, for a greater goal. Who is that? What do you mean by that? Just expand on that a little bit. Well, you know, in the end, it's it's the the idea that our politicians are the ones that run the show. Uh, that's you know, like like Barack Obama's out there actually in charge. You know, he's more or less a puppet. You know, the real the real power is behind it. The people who are the the private shareholders of the Federal Reserve. You know, those are the real powers when it comes down to it in the United States. That that power structure and, and the apparatus that they use to, to manipulate, you know, and move things, right? That's really where it goes. And I don't know what the names of these folks are. I don't really care. I just, I just see the actions and I can see rhetoric's rhetoric. And you can tell that that doesn't mean anything, but what are they doing? That's what matters, right? Destabilizing the Middle East, that kind of stuff. You know, those people are not fighting out there for, for, for free democracy or whatever the media will have you think. You look at pictures, these people have like 50 millimeter bullets on their chest. That's not some bullet that they kept in their closet. They're, they're being, you know, somebody's giving them those bullets, right? So it's, it's a bigger, something else is going on here, larger than, than what the media will tell you. And I'm not trying to say that I know, you know, specifically what's happening. But it doesn't, it's not, I know I'm not being told the truth, right? That, that I know. I think that's a pretty good bet that none of us are being told the truth. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I, I would agree with you there. So, hey, in terms of devaluation of the dollar and other currencies, if you want to address any of those, what do you think the future looks like in terms of inflation? I, I believe we are in for the most severe bout of inflation we've ever seen in the USA. And when you look back to the Jimmy Carter era in the 70s, and and the beginning of the 80s when Reagan was changing things, that's just nothing compared to what, what I think is coming. I think hyperinflation is a very real and significant possibility. What do you think? What do those numbers look like? You know, if you look at it like right now, uh, for instance, you, you put some money or some dollars in the in the bank. What what type of interest rate are they going to pay you? They're going to pay you like 1%, right? You know, 0.5%. Where, you know, if you look at the real facts of it, you know, if you actually calculate how food and, you know, your roof over your head costs, how much that's been running, you know, inflation is probably real. Real inflation is probably like 8, 9, 10%. Now, let's, you know, just try doubling that up. That's, that's probably where we're headed, you know, when this thing sits, really starts getting going. There'll be like a 20% gap between what they'll pay you for your cash and what, you know, truly you're losing every year. Now, you do that not just one year, but you do that 
multiple years in a row, and that's going to create a big difference, right? It's compounding. It's just like compounding interest, right? And it's the same story. I mean, inflation, when it compounds, can make a big difference. And, you know, ultimately, like I said in the beginning, I think is where we have to move is the dollar has to be slashed by about 60%, 70%, right? So how many years of, you know, of a 10% gap like we're currently in do we need to get to there? Is that five to 10 years? It's probably going to get worse than it is now. So, you know, we're talking 20% gap between what the banks will actually pay and what the real inflation rate is. And the whole time they'll keep telling you the CM, you know, they're, they're, they're basically their, what is the word they use for the inflation index? It's, uh, well, the CPI, it, yeah. CPI, exactly. But what Mike Maloney calls it is the CPI. Yeah, right. That's a, a great, you know. that's a great name. The CP lie. Let's, right. let's call it the CPL, the CP <laughs> lie. Yeah. You know, I, I love how they even dare to quote core inflation, the core rate, where they take out food and energy as if any of us could survive without food and energy, right? Uh, yeah, I know. It's, it's amazing that they still, I don't know, like, uh, where do they get off even saying that that makes any sense and, and people actually listen to it or even reporting it for, you know, they shouldn't even report the thing. It's, you know, it's, it's such a sham. Well, I, I say that the next time you buy anything, just tell the vendor you're buying it from that you want to pay the core rate. Next time you're at the yeah, grocery right. store or the gas station, <laughs> see if you can pay the core rate rather than the real inflation rate. Yeah, yeah very, the price tag guy. Very good <laughs> Use point. Use the core rate, please. You spent a couple of years in Latin America where you really witnessed firsthand the dramatic effects of what happened in Argentina about nine years ago, ten years ago. And Argentina, it's interesting when you look at Argentina because a hundred years ago, Argentina was sort of slated to be like the world's leading economy, possibly rich in resources, but they just, it, it's almost as if corruption in, in Central and South America is just, it's kind of just part of the personality. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, uh, it certainly has been. It's part and parcel, kind of, everybody's used to it. Yeah, it, it, it is really interesting. I, I mean, Argentina has just been the poster child for financial chaos. What did you see when you were over there? Well, I went down there in uh, 2003, 2004. Yeah, I was down there for almost a year. And so the Argentina, Argentina, they have they've had numerous bouts of inflation, right? And late 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 1980s, they had a hyperinflation there. Then throughout the 90s, in the early 90s, they basically they pegged their peso with the U.S. dollar one to one, and that lasted for like seven or eight years, where they just kept it one to one, and it worked out fine. But all the while, they were basically you know, just taking on more and more debt as a government. So people were living great. You know, they were traveling abroad. Their pesos were buying them tons of stuff. And you got to remember, too, in the late 90s, you know, a lot of people in Argentina, they're like second, third generation Europeans. So they're going over to Europe, buying up cheap euros with their pesos because they're just as powerful as dollars. And you remember, in the late 90s, our dollars could buy a lot of euros, right? So they lived a great time in the 90s. There was a, you know, great bubble of, of, of uh, surplus there. But when I went down there, you know, that was a year or two after the crisis. The crisis happened at the end of 2001, early 2002, where basically they, they had to break the peg. Uh, and they had to come clean with how bad the debt was. Uh, all the insiders in that country pretty much moved all their, their capital outside of the system. They moved it offshore uh, and, and just put, parked their funds in dollars or in euros. Um, so they basically, all the insiders basically tripled, quadrupled their money because after they unpegged the peso to the dollar, it went from one to one to about four to one, uh, and then kind of shook back to three to one. So basically all the pensioners and all the people who had their, you know, do their, their dollars or pesos in the bank, even the people with dollars in the bank, the, the government made them switch it to pesos and, and then devalued. So even those people got screwed over. So everyone pretty much that wasn't in the know got their uh, savings thirded or quartered. And the remainder of the people who did, who were inside, uh, you know, quadrupled, fourfolded their money. Uh, so it was, uh, it was definitely a, a sad thing, and people were angry as hell, right? And you had people running around the streets. The banks were closed for about a, you know a month or so. Things weren't working that well. ATMs weren't working that well. People got very, got very violent there. People were killed in the streets. Uh, I think some, some like 30 people died. Um, and then afterward, I think there was actually some starvation that occurred in, in rural parts of the area in the country. So for me, I got there. I, didn't, I wasn't there during the mess, but I came to see after the after effects in 2003. So it was about a year, year and a half afterward. So when I was speaking to people down there about their experience, uh, their firsthand experience, you know, what would come out would be two things. You know, it was basically uh, anger would come out would come right across of, of what the government had done to them. Uh, and then secondly, it was, you know, disillusionment with 
the current state of affairs of their country and the, the future potential of what, what would happen. They just, it's, you almost get this sense of hopelessness, like it doesn't matter. Even if things get better for a little while, they'll do it again. They just, that's all that happens, right? So it was, it was very sad to see. And the, probably the worst part of it all is the combination of you see old folks having to get back in the subway, having to go back to work. Those people should be retired. They worked their entire lives, and then a, a bunch of greedy people went off and, and you know, fixed the game and stole their money. And now they have to go back to work. Where's the justice in that? And, and then secondly, you have kids in the street. you got little kids all around the streets having to pick up garbage at night so, you know, families can eat. Uh, you know, we have little kids picking up literally styrofoam in the streets. That kind of stuff, when you start seeing that, it, it's it's just very sad, you know, to know that there's some people out there who have no qualms to take, you know, advantage of people to where they have to live like that. So it was just a, it was just an eye opener to know that evil exists and it's out there and that it will it will act that way, it will treat people that way, and that you have to guard against it, you have to look out for it. And coming back here and living in the United States and seeing what's happened, you know, when I started getting exposed with Ron Paul in 2007, 2008. And, you know, I had a little bit of experience with Austrian economics in college, learning about the, the fiat currency systems and the Federal Reserve and just kind of how this is all a bunch of hocus pocus. Uh, basically, it, everything's set up for, for the bankers to take advantage, right? So for me to see it happening here in slow motion, it's very difficult to take. So I guess that's why I'm standing where I am, trying to do as much as I can to try and get people to take some form of action. Yeah, so in terms of protecting oneself, it just astounds me virtually every day how people james they just they don't want to hear it they they're not taking it seriously they don't understand the urgency and i think precious metals is a good way to save money it's certainly a lot better than paper and ink with pictures of dead presidents on it but people they, i don't know they it's kind of amazing and and you and I and the people listening to the show we get it we know what's coming we know what has to come we know what has to happen here there isn't a question of will it happen or not we know it will happen it will surely come to pass now exactly when none of us can really say but we know what will happen here people will l lose their standard of living and it may be extremely ugly it may be just uh, uncomfortable. It will vary depending on how people have positioned themselves for the coming situation with inflation and so forth. But doesn't it amaze you how some people I'm sure you talk to in your practice just kind of don't get it? Yeah, that's a that's a point that I always, it's hard, right? So like uh, about a month ago, right, I was out in Santa Monica Pier, uh, or actually on Third Street Promenade. We were, we were doing a little uh, um, it was a buy local event. So goldsilver.com, we had our little display out there and we had the public. And this is, you know, this is more or less your common person who likes to go to the mall, right? You, you kind of get the sense of the public. It's, you get this attitude, like a know-it-all attitude, like, oh, I know it all, you know, and then you ask him certain questions like, well, what, what do you think this gold coin's worth? And, you know, you ask hundreds of people and maybe three or four people would know within $100 what gold spot was. And nobody knew what silver spot was, right? So, so you have this attitude of these folks think that they know it all, but really the TVs is what they know. You know, that's it. They don't read books, they don't know history. You know, they're just they're just made to be taken advantage of. It, it's pretty sad. The combination too, though, you got to remember, and, and, and there's a lot of people out there who are in debt. You know, who who whenever the subject of money is brought up, you know, bells go off in their head. They think, oh no, money. I, you know, they just start to feel like a loser. I mean, any time the idea of money comes up, right? Um, so that's one thing to also keep in, in, in mind. There's just a lot of people who just don't have any money. That is the situation that we're in. There's a lot of people in debt. But, yeah, the amount of people out there who don't know the fundamental reasons of why what's going on, and I think a lot of it is the attitude. They, they just don't want to hear it or they don't want to learn. And it, it is frustrating. It certainly is. Back to Argentina for a moment, James. Your firsthand experience there is really interesting. One of the things that people are talking about, and I think is rather likely as the government becomes progressively more and more insolvent, the numbers on the way the United States is behaving financially are beyond appalling. I mean, they are just beyond 
beyond comprehension how the interest on the debt is is just going to just cremate the future of, of the country's balance sheet. You look at like 45% of the people in the country now are getting government assistance. 42% are on food stamps. Forgive me if my numbers are ever so slightly off. I'm giving general numbers. But these are just quick stats you hear. And you've got a position where the balance has almost shifted to where when you get that sort of 51% tipping point, when 51% of the people are getting stuff for free from the government and not paying taxes, then they're just going to keep voting themselves more perks and goodies and welfare and entitlements. And boy, when you get in that position, there's just really no recovery, I think, without severe, severe consequences. And in Argentina, they nationalize the pensions. And I think that likelihood is pretty significant here, where the government would say something to the effect of maybe they'd engineer a stock market crash. And there's the plunge protection team pulling the strings behind the markets. And they might engineer a crash and come along and say, you know, for the public good, we need to put the pensions, put everyone's IRA under the control of the government just like Social Security. And that's the Argentinian plan. And and they'll just go and usurp people's retirement accounts and say, look, the government is going to take care of you and we're going to guarantee you a check. And I, I mean, gosh, the government's resume is so wonderful on having managed Social Security so well and <laughs> everything else, everything the government touches turns to disaster, basically. Do you think there's a possibility in the U.S. of, of, of a movement toward nationalizing the pensions? There is. I mean, it's quite. It is a threat. It's something that is out there that could possibly occur, right? It, it, I mean, the government nowadays has gone so crazy, so rogue. I mean, they can they can confiscate your life if they so so choose. You know, if Obama wants you dead, he can have you dead. If you move to another country, it doesn't matter. You know, they can just knock you off. Uh, that's legally they claim they have that right. They they can spy on you. So there's all types of things that that could possibly happen. You know, and so you have to plan, I suppose, for a bunch of different scenarios. I wouldn't put all my bags in, in one basket ever, because uh, you know potentially the, the outcomes of this there's a myriad of factors, a myriad of things that could happen, right? So you know if I was somebody who had everything in my IRA, you know I might be a little bit afraid. Uh, because that potentially there is that that, that threat. Uh, it's happened before in history. It certainly could happen again. Something everybody needs to be watchful for. I tell you, it really disincentivizes me to be putting money into my IRA, my pension plan, my SEP, because I'm just worried that that's just too easily nationalized. And, you know, everything has to be an arm's length transaction. So you can't hold anything physical in that plan. It all has to be arm's length away from you, which means you're not really in control of it. So that concerns me. And, you know, that's one of the things I like about having some of my savings in physical metals. And I should say, just for the listener's sake, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but my grandfather was a a bit of a coin collector, and he suffered a home invasion robbery. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt in any real way, but guys just came to the door with guns, and the dog came at them, and they just took the butt of the pistol and hit the dog on the head and conked the dog out and tied up my grandfather and my grandmother and took all the coins. And I I don't think it's very safe to keep this stuff in anyone's house. I had Howard Ruff on the show, and he likes this Midnight Gardener product where you hide it in the ground. (laughs) And some people say the safe deposit box or the self-storage unit or whatever. What are your thoughts on storage? Yeah, that's a a great question. Um, At goldsilver.com, we give our customers a lot of options because of that, you know, the obvious, you don't want to put everything in one basket. It goes back to that. Personally, I think it has. It does make a little sense. I think to have some in your hand, right? Just in case of like uh, a lightning bolt, you know, currency crisis where something happens and all of a sudden, you know, the banks close for a little while. It would be nice to have a little bit of money at your fingertips. That, as well as some cash, it makes sense to have a little bit of cash at home. You know, that way you don't have to go chasing around trying to find an ATM that works. That would be the first thing. Just to have some at home. If you're going for a large investment in gold and silver. You know, like I said, diversifying where your locations are, it makes a lot of sense. We offer our customers third-party vault storage. Uh, it's the safest method of storing precious metals in, in the industry. It's called segregated vault storage, and it's with third-party companies. We work with Brinks in Salt Lake City and Brinks in Hong Kong and BMAT in Miami. Uh, we'll be bringing on, I think, a Canadian one very shortly as well. But these are places where, you know, and I've, I've been to every one of these facilities. You know, you have your metal shipped there. 
in, in, they're stored there. You get certificates signed uh, by the third party manager, whether it's Brinks or Viamat. Um, it is fully insured by either Lloyds of London, Marshall McLennan, and a few different other insurance companies sometimes. But um, they're always insured, and it's just a really safe and convenient way to have you know a good chunk of holdings outside of the banking uh, structure. And it's only one call away to, to, to liquidate it, or you can always have it shipped somewhere. For instance, um, if you have your precious metals sitting in Brinks and Salt Lake City, and let's just say it gets very bad a couple of years from now, and you decide, you know, I, I have some relatives in New Zealand or in Australia or England, I want to go live with them. You can you can have those precious metals shipped out of out of the United States currently, uh, and you know we've delivered over 40 countries. So, having precious metals in segregated vault storage facilities with us, you can move it cross border if you want to. So it gives you some flexibility. It gives you a little bit more sovereignty than some than just having it all in your closet, right? So that that's one thing that we really give at GoldSilver.com. We give our customers a little bit more of an advantage in that regard. For myself, I I kind of divvy, you know, I, I would majority hold in, in the segregated vault storage. I do hold some at home. Um, it, and, if, you know, as we go forward, you know, it gets a little bit worrisome. You know, if somebody kind of memorizes my face, you know, or whatnot and knows me. You know, yeah, and I was wondering, probably... could could you give the listeners your address, please? <laughs> Just yeah, right. <laughs> 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 yeah, it won't be long. It'll probably be, ter- I'll, I'll be shipping that stuff off to Miami yes, probably uh, shortly. I hope, I hope you will after <laughs> saying that on the air. Hey, but, you know, I, I want to just, and, and feel free to go on with what you were saying in a moment, but b- before you move on too much, James, I just want to play devil's advocate with you on this storage stuff, because sure. I had Peter Schiff on the show quite a while back, and he's selling these Perth Mint gold things, so you keep your gold in the mint in Perth and you get a certificate. Isn't that just like having a stupid stock certificate or a dollar, which is fiat money? You got a piece of paper. I think the whole point of having metals is to have physical metals. Otherwise, why not just buy an ETF or a COMEX future or something like that? Yeah, there's two, two, well, there's a bunch of things. First off, the metals are yours. They're segregated. They're fully in your title and name. They're not goldsilver.com's metals. Uh, so there's nothing in the contract that would actually give us any type of leverage on your metal. For instance, my, my account at VMAT Miami, it's A to B. I, I call the, the manager in VMAT Miami, and I have a personal relationship with him, and it's that, that's that simple. So uh, there's a lot of situations where it's A to B. Those are my metals. I ship them off. They're segregated fully. I can go visit them. If I want, I can have them shipped anywhere. There are different types of metals investors. There's the person who's the sort of, I'll call them the survivalist. The person who thinks imminent, disastrous collapse. Well, for that person and that thinking, if that scenario happens, I don't think the segregated vault or any kind of certificate is going to do anybody any good because everybody's going to lock everything up and take it all for themselves. I, You know, I don't know. Maybe that's just my crazy paranoia. And then there's the person who's just sort of the money investor who wants to make a good return on their money and doesn't want to see their, their dollar debased. And, and they'd much rather save money in metals, which I couldn't agree more. It's much better than dollars. And that's a kind of a different kind of person. But in the, in the event of real economic collapse, you want to have it on hand, right? I think so. I mean, the idea that you, you want to have it in hand, of course, because who's, who are you going to trust? Everywhere you go, it doesn't matter where you go, where you head, Jason. And there's always risk. There's li- there's risk in breathing the next breath, okay? That's life. So you can live in, in fear and, and go to the to the bottom with some paranoia and think of, well, this this then, this then this would happen and I'd lose it all or what have you. You can really go to the far length with fear and then you really have no chance. You know, it, it basically... If you have it in your hand, great. Somebody can rob you. Uh, uh, if you have it in a segregated vault storage facility, okay, great. Somebody ends up taking it from there and confiscating your wealth or something. You know, there's there's no end to it, right? So what I what I propose is that you wouldn't put it all in one place, right? Because the chances of it happening in all these different places, then you know that that's pretty slim. So in the idea that the rule of law would just completely fall kaput and people are running around taking things from one another, that's a little bit far-fetched, I think. I think a, when people start talking about, you know, there being a breakup of society and all of a sudden, you know, the rule of law is just completely out the window and you're going to have to have your beans and your guns and go to the hills, no. No, that's, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. But are they going to debase the dollar in 60, 70% of the coming years? Yeah, I do. I think that's that's where we're headed. So maybe let me ask you another question about what I think is a possible Ponzi scheme, and that is the COMEX 
people that are buying certificate type metals uh, on the COMEX, they make it very hard to actually take delivery. And and that's what, like I've expressed already, I like about a dealership like yours where you can take delivery of stuff. Do you have any thoughts on the COMEX? There are those who think that's a Ponzi scheme, that maybe oh, yeah. the, the metal isn't really there to back up all the stuff they're selling. Maybe the metal behind all these ETFs and these other various funds is not, it doesn't really exist. They're just selling you paper. Well, that spot price that you see every day, um, you know, like the, we discussed earlier, I think the, we closed today around 47.75. You know, that's what the spot price is, right? That's that's the spot price on the Comex exchange. And if for those of you know those of you out there who don't know, but that's where the that's where the spot price is actually made out of. It's these different exchanges around the world. And you know, there's been people who have been out there and who have admitted the fact that. Uh, the Comex exchanges and the London Bullion exchanges. There, Jeffrey Christensen of Jeffrey Christian of uh, CPM Group was on a video on YouTube um, where he was, uh, I believe, he was giving testimony to, to some to some folks in government, and he admitted the fact that the the the, the, the Comex and and London Bullion exchange they are leveraged anywhere from 100 to one to 40 to one somewhere in that area, and he literally said 100 to one. I mean, think about that. Unbelievable. That is, that is, some real fractional reserve banking right there, right? And that's uh, supposed to be the real deal. That's supposed to really be money. <laughs> right, exactly. Unlike the banks, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what we have here is basically a big game of musical chairs, and the music's still playing in the comics market, and it's, it's still playing on, on the London Bullion Exchange. Um, but when the people, you know, come rushing in mass to actually uh, to, to come and collect their medals that they think is there, there's only going to be so many chairs, right? So the, the, the truth of this is we saw it in 2008, and we'll see it again. Uh, the price in 2008 for silver and gold, when the banks were exploding, um, you know there was a lot of deflationary pressure out there. So gold went down in price. So did silver. The spot price in silver went down to like nine dollars, right? But that was just the spot price. To actually get physical in your hands, you had to pay a serious premium because the market there's just not that much supply. You know the industry, it's just not set up to serve. You know, however hundreds of millions of people you know were out there looking to buy gold and silver at that time. It just it basically there's only so much supply. So the, the spot price was at nine dollars in two thousand eight, whereas to get physical silver in your hand, you had to pay like fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen dollars. I mean, Mike Maloney, he he made. I was sitting there, you know, on the phone. He said to pull up eBay. We looked at eBay. There were silver eagles being sold on eBay in two thousand eight for twenty, twenty five, thirty, thirty five dollars. You right? know, I, I've looked that up myself, and I think people would be crazy to buy this stuff on eBay. It's usually a terrible deal, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it depends, right? It, it does. If the market, especially when the market's climbing, yes, you'll pay through the eye on eBay. When the market's going down and, and the interest isn't, it's not there. If the price is going down, only the intelligent people come in and buy when the price is going down. Um, it, when the price is running up and running up and running up, you have the crowds come in, people who aren't even doing their due diligence, people who just Googled gold and silver and now they're ready to buy. They, they don't even know fundamentally why they're buying it. So th there's a different crowd, right? When the price is escalating, They'll run to eBay and they'll pay through the eye. You know, they don't care. They just got to have it. You know, it's the next hot thing. So back to the point, though, the point of this whole thing is that you will see in the future a day when the spot price will completely diverge from the physical price. I mean, it's happening now, right? We talked about Silver Eagles. They're sitting at $54, $55 when you're buying them physically yeah, from the market. Yeah, and, and you know what I want to say to that? Ouch, that premium's high. That, that's a lot. It certainly is. But the other thing is, is that, you know, as this goes forward, and even now, when you go to sell those silver eagles, you're fetching more than the spot price. And, and that'll be the, the eventual where we're going to head. You're going to see a gold spot price that might say 2500 and you'll be buying gold at 3000 and selling it at 2750 or something like that. You know, there will be a, a, a serious divergence between the paper and physical, especially in silver, because there's only so much silver to go around. And, you know, I'm sure... I'm sure you're aware of this, but there's less silver for investors out there than there is gold in the world today. So the silver market's very small. It doesn't take much to move it. Um, when people go rushing into silver, it, it vanishes, and the premiums go up for the physical. So you know, in the future, I, we do expect divergence between the physical and, and the paper market to where the, you know, the physical – at this point, the physical market is really ruling the day, but there will be – it will become more and more obvious as we go forward. we got to wrap up here, but one thing I'd like to ask you about, James, is – and I – honestly, I haven't found this to be very favorable for the investor, so you, you alluded to it a moment ago, so I just want to ask you about it. Maybe we can wrap up with this topic, but I know that it's easy for a, an owner of gold or silver to sell the metal, but under what method and what terms? Because I – 
checked around on that a few times, and I had to ship my gold or silver back to a place. So, you know, I'm concerned about shipping, first of all, but you can ensure that. And then, how do I know that when they open the package, they're going to count the same number of coins that I counted when I sent it? And they say, well, this is all done with cameras and so forth. And and, and then after that, they wanted a pretty big spread between what that day I had to buy it for and from what that day they would buy it for. It's one thing to sort of quote the price, but it's another thing to actually have a liquid market where you can sell it. I mean, the nice thing about these stupid dollars is at least you can trade them, at least for now. <laughs> and and you don't, well, you don't think you pay a premium when you buy and sell them, but I guess you really do. It's called inflation and taxation. But what do you say about the, the, the ease of selling them and how, what's the spread? What do people really lose when they buy and sell gold and silver bullion? Sure. Uh, in the physical form, it's not a it's not a type of investment that you want to like trade. If you want to be a day trader and play in manipulated markets, you know you should go for an ETF. But if you want to hold something outside of the you know financial industry that's real money, you buy bullion. And you know depending on how much you're buying and what form will depend on the spread that you're going to have to pay. Uh, if you're buying a good amount of gold, uh, you shouldn't pay. You know spreads shouldn't be more than five percent between what you're actually buying it and then what you can turn around to sell it with. You know, if you're buying a good amount of gold, that's all it takes is a 5% move in gold to break even. And silver, it depends on how much you're buying, right? If you, if you come to a dealer to buy like 20 silver coins, it takes as much time for that dealer to service you as it does for someone else buying 20,000 of them, right? And now, it's the same thing. I mean, they gotta, you got to put it in a box. you got to, you know, put all the stuff through their system. Uh, you got to get in line. I mean, it's, it just takes just as much time. So the spread between the guy who's buying one tube of silver versus the guy who's buying cases of them uh, will be a little bit larger. I would imagine for a tube, you're probably talking about 20%, 15% spread. Now, anybody who says, oh, that's huge, that's ridiculous, well, that's fine. Uh, but you can look at what happened in the last eight months. I mean, silver's basically doubled in price. It doesn't take any time for silver to move 10 to 15%. It, you know, you could literally break even before the box gets to you. And it's the same thing. I mean, if you're getting a lot of silver, it can be in the single digits. It can get down to 5% if you're getting a lot. So just to clarify it, if someone buys a box of 500 silver coins and say they pay, just for round numbers sake, $20,000 for that. And the spot price of those coins is, what is the spot price? Maybe $18,000? Is that yeah, about right? That, 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 that'd be fair. And then, and then say it didn't go up in value, say it just maintained, and then six months later or a year later, and the, you know, the prices were the same. You were still selling the same box for 20 grand, and uh, the spot price was still 18,000. So you guys are making two grand on that deal, or not really because you pay the mint a premium too that you get it from. Right. But, but whatever, you're, the investor thinks it's a $2,000 premium. That's what they see. And then they sell it to you, and how much are you going to pay them for that $20,000 box? Well, on our website at goldsilver.com, you see both prices. Uh, it's printed there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and those prices are live, right? So you come to our website, you'll see what it costs to buy, and you'll see what, it's, what we're paying for it at that moment. And that doesn't end. Um, we'll always be buying and selling gold and silver no matter where we are. Even at the tip of a market, it goes that way. So it's published, and it's right there on the website. For a Silver Eagle, like, for instance, you were at that example where you said, you know, 20000 to buy the case, the spot price, you know, it's basically eighteen. You know, you're talking uh, in terms of um, for for that case, it'd probably be like eighteen thousand five hundred that we'd be buying it back. We'd definitely be buying it back over spot. When it comes to uh, all the products in bullion in the United States, the one that gets the biggest premium is the Silver Eagle, both ways. You know, not just not just for the buyer, but you know, and I know people don't like to pay the premium or whatnot, but that's fine. You know, but if you if you go the wrong route and you buy the wrong product, you'll be regretting it the whole way through. You know, if you get something that has a weak hallmark that nobody respects, and you come to the table with that, you're going to get scoffed at and get a weak bid. And that's for me, it just makes sense to go with products that everyone knows and respects, and that you have various options to sell it. You don't have to sell it to the same dealer you bought it from. You always want to have multiple exit strategy. Uh, you know, you have to have multiple ideas of how you would exit this market, and you know, do it in a nice, calm manner. Uh, but but sometimes you never know. It could be so busy at the end of this market that some dealers are you can't even get through the phone, right? So what would you do in that case? Who are you going to go to sell to? And if you have a product that only they sell, then are they, is anyone else going to buy it back? You know, those are the types of worries that can happen. But I but I just want to I, I just want to clarify something there. So it sure. sounds like the I'm going to call them the closing costs 
on that deal of that silver box that we just traded, right, it are about 7.5% then. When, when you say closing costs, you mean... Well, um, the cost to trade it back and forth. The, yeah, to buy exactly. If you did it, it in the same day, yeah. that would well, be about or, right. Or a year later and say the price of silver didn't change. So I'm, I'm paying us basically 7.5%. Those are my closing costs. My trading cost, right? Yep. That Not was, including that any be... storage fees for storing it, which is probably minimal. Mm -hmm. Good to know. What were you going to say? And let's wrap up. Get your final thoughts. I, I just wanted to clarify that for the listeners because I didn't know if it was clear. Oh, it was just the final thought was that, you know, having having hallmarks that everyone respects, not just in the United States, but around the world makes a lot of sense. So if there's people out there who are really, you know, interested in getting a, a, a tight premium close to the spot price, you know, just stick with maybe 100 ounce bars that are well known, like Johnson Matthew, that type of thing. Sometimes people want to want to buy off off brand products that you know then you have to go back to that dealer really to get you know a decent bid some other dealers might not even want it so don't pigeonhole yourself in a place like that you want to make sure you have products that are well known and respected so you have multiple options good point all right well james anderson thank you so much the website goldsilver.com i appreciate your education you got some other great educational pieces on your website and uh, these are ominous times we're living in and i think people have really got to be paying attention all of you listeners please tell everyone you know run around town and say inflation is coming inflation is coming because it is and we can't tell you exactly when but all the signs are there and you better prepare yourself because you're going to be sorry if you don't so james we appreciate the insights today thank you so much well thank you a tip of the cap for what you're doing and uh it's uh, it's very nice to be on your show the american monetary association is a non-profit venture funded by the jason hartman foundation which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.